city's subway. It's like the metro. It was morning rush hour. <laughs> and it wasn't pretty. I was crammed in that train car with the other citizens of New York City. We weren't awake yet. We were trying not to spill coffee on each other. We were clutching our cell phones. And to top it all off, there's a young mother sitting with a screaming toddler. Screaming. So over by the door, there was this um, gentleman who I noticed because he was taller than everybody else, and he was wearing this spectacular suit. But I think what really caught my eye about him was the fact that it was as if he was in his own cool little bubble while the rest of us were suffering. To my surprise, this man suddenly spoke to the people around him. He said, excuse me, pardon me. He walked right over to that screaming child crouched down next to him, and he said, What do you need, little man? <laughs> the kid stopped screaming. The mom's face flashed from hopeless to terrified to relieved. The two of them chatted for a few minutes. I couldn't hear what they said at this point. But I noticed that the shoulders of every person on that train car dropped about an inch. A few uh, stations later, he got off. And I guarantee wherever he was going, in that fabulous suit, when he got there, he didn't do that performance. What do you need, little man? <laughs> no, when he got there, he did a very different performance. But all of us on that train car were so grateful for the risky, creative choice that he made in that moment. So I've told that story many times. Um, the business executives that I work with at Performance of a Lifetime workshops find that story helpful to think about all the choices that we each have available to us all the time. Forgive me, I'm so emotional from all the talks this morning. I'm forgetting what I want to say, so I brought this up with me. Um, okay, yeah, so I want to talk about his choices. So he, he could have yelled at that mom. He could have said, get that kid off the train. He could have just stayed quietly in his cool little bubble, silent, not doing anything. But instead, he made this improvisational choice to walk toward the screaming kid to say yes and, and engage. So many of us here know that improvisational game, New Choice. Yeah. Well, that's basically what we do uh, with our clients at Performance of a Lifetime. We help them imagine, improvise, and perform new choices. Choices that diverge from the status quo. Choices that might feel impossible or unnatural. And it's kind of subversive, really. Um, it's a subversive thing to do because, because we're helping people break the rules and make up new ones. We're saying things don't have to be the way they always have been. You don't have to be the way you always have been. We're encouraging our clients to perform their way into new possibilities. So speaking of possibilities and subversion um, and subways, the history of performance of a lifetime, some of it, can be found on the subway. Um, our CEO and co-founder, Kathy Salit, some of you know her, longtime AIM member, she uh, is a radical and community activist, and in the early 80s, she... Uh, with a small group of other people, got together and decided they wanted to change the world. Specifically, they wanted to start a union of poor people in New York City. And the way they would do this is they would get on the subway trains, and they would make announcements, and they would do scenes about the importance of empowering the poor, and the crisis of capitalism, and other lefty pronouncements. And they would sell their radical newspapers. Now, this, this performance, 
that they would do. Uh, it was unusual. You know, people were, people were not um, getting on subway trains in those days and making announcements. In fact, we can probably uh, thank them for all the people that now get on subways <laughs> and make announcements. Um, it seemed impossible. It was hard. They got arrested a lot. But they kept doing it. They kept asking people to stand up as citizens of New York and help the poor. And it worked. The nickels, dimes, and quarters that they raised uh, funded free legal clinics all over New York City. And, uh, and in the end, built a union of over 8,000 people on welfare and um, on unemployment. So Kathy and her comrades were subversive. They wouldn't have called what they were doing improvisation, because improv wasn't in the common lexicon yet. But they were getting on these train cars and making up scenes. It looked different every time. And instead of simply saying no to what was happening in the world, they said yes. And they built with what was there. And that use of performance for social change is happening all over the world. It's becoming a global movement. It's it's what I'm hearing from all of you over the last couple of days. It's one of the reasons I'm so emotional. And like yesterday, we heard from Caitlin about the book that she did with Teresa. All the stories that are being gathered of the work, people, the work that people are doing and the impact that it is having and how your stories are going to be in addition to three, four, five, six, and seven. Right? So we're all using applied improvisation in different ways. And we all talk about it in different ways. But what we're doing by helping people perform in new ways is helping them subvert their own personal status quos and the larger cultural status quos. They're saying we're helping them be who they are and who they are not yet. Who they are becoming. So I'm going to talk about this idea of becoming very briefly. At Performance of a Lifetime, we call it the becoming principle. And the core of the idea is that in order to grow and change, you have to tap in to some of the basic human capabilities of being able to perform and pretend and play. And that's what enables you to grow and change. Yeah, it's cute. What's she doing? She's performing. And the nearest adult joins in that performance and says, I know, sweetheart, cell phone service is terrible here. And that's when something amazing happens. In that ensemble performance, because that, that's what enables that little girl to learn how to talk. Because in that ensemble performance, the adult is relating to that child as who she is and who she is not yet. Who she is becoming. That, that capacity for growth, for transformation that we have as children, it doesn't go away when we grow up. We can reignite that with performance and improvisation. And that's what I hear everybody talking about. That's what you are doing. When we um, help, when we work with veterans with improv, or with teenagers, or in Israel in the army, or in Japan in the educational system, we are helping people subvert their status quo. We're reminding them they can change their lives. And we're helping them be who they are and who they are not yet, who they are becoming. So I'm going to close with one of my favorite quotations. Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. This was said by cultural anthropologist Margaret Mead. 
And it's true that a small group of people can change the world for good or ill. It's one of the reasons she used the word citizens. Um, oh, God, they're coming to hug me. <laughs> so Marguerite was a rule breaker. She was a change maker because she taught the world that we can, she showed the world that the rules that we think of as our culture are changeable and they look different all over the world and she was also my grandmother. Oh. And she would love you all, I'm gone, she would love you all for being the thoughtful, committed citizens that you are who are changing the world.